As the new Chair of Leisure and Community Development, I am delighted to welcome you to our third talk in our series of NI Centenary Talks, hosted by the Irish Linden Centre and the Spur Museum. This evening you'll hear from Roy Greer um, talk on what's yours is mine and what's mine is yours, as he explores the issues of language, identity and our shared cultural history. I hope you enjoy tonight and thank you for being part of our online talks. Um, good evening folks and uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm delighted to have, have been uh, invited to talk to you uh, as part of the Lisburn and Castlereagh Council uh, commemoration of the centenary of Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm also here um, today, obviously, um, events at Stormont, uh, particularly around culture, make me uh, perhaps a little more nervous about uh, uh, letting um, about putting my thoughts uh, on screen and on video, but I'll do my best. Uh, first of all, I, I think it's important to declare that uh, I come from a background um, where I am unionist. I see myself as British and Ulster Scots. So anything I say tonight, tonight um, if I can just go back a second, um, should be viewed in, in light of that. I think um, an awful lot of what happens on television and media, um, folk are not upfront about where they're coming from. So I, I want to be clear about that. So um, there won't be a mask that slips. I am a unionist. I am a proud Ulster Scot, and I'm proud of being from Northern Ireland. But I do believe that this is a great place to live. I do believe that we have a, a country that if we learn to share and grow together, we can make this place great. We can make it good for everybody. And that is something that I feel that I want to share this evening with you. And hopefully, um, hopefully we'll, we'll provide you with some food for thought. So um, obviously this is part of the uh, centenary of Northern Ireland and, and part of the um, Lisburn and Castlereagh uh, response to, to that commemoration or celebration. Um, and I'm sure that you, you'll be very aware that there are people who are totally, you know, um, nonplussed by the centenary. You know, people who are skeptical about it and maybe dismissive of it. And, and there'll be some folk who um, we know are, are totally opposed to it uh, and, um, and find it offensive even. Um, to quote REM, that's me in the corner. I am an enthusiast. I am enthusiastic about our centenary. Am I unaware of the fact that Northern Ireland has problems and difficulties and, and many of those difficulties have continued throughout its existence? Of course not. Of course not. But I do think there's much to celebrate and that we can celebrate together and that we can own together. Because if we don't have ownership together of this piece of earth, then this land, this country cannot move forward and will not move forward. I suppose the nub of it is unless we learn to share this piece of earth together, then we're going nowhere. We'll go backwards. I think, I believe that we can all move forwards. You know, I love this country. I love being Northern Irish. There was a time in my life when I wouldn't perhaps have used that term so freely. I'm Northern Irish. I'm from the island of Ireland. Some people will call me Irish from time to time, and I don't get offended by that anymore. But I'm proud to be from this place. And I think that the people I know from all communities are fantastic and wonderful, warm, friendly and giving people. And I think we just have to get over some of our, some of our camp, we, we need to come out of our camps. We need to put on different spectacles that, sh that will allow us to look into the other person's viewpoint, the other person's position, and learn to understand and appreciate it and grow together. So in this centenary, I will be celebrating Northern Ireland's 100th birthday. You know, I love coming in over 
uh, having maybe been on a holiday, and I know not many of us have been on holiday recently, but there's nothing better than flying in from some dry and dusty, sun-kissed island over Northern Ireland, over the patchwork quilt of grain and ploughed fields, and stepping off that plane into the chill of the evening and some fine mizzle descending on my somewhat uncovered head, and there's nothing better. But this province, this place, was not born uh, in, uh, in the midst of a rose garden. It didn't spring from um, a, a good place. In fact, we know from our history that the, uh, it precedes the Home Rule crisis, of course, but the Home Rule crisis really brought about the birth of Northern Ireland. Uh, and as that developed and as unionist opposition to home rule, uh, which they viewed as Rome rule, and perhaps if we look at the inception of the Irish Free State, we can see that there was merit in their argument. That state could perhaps be viewed as a theocracy. And yet we know now that the Irish Republic, as, as it would become, became, ha, has become a very liberal democracy in the, modern, in the modern world. But at this time, unionists were totally opposed to the view of home rule because they felt they would be subsumed into an Irish state that would be a Catholic state and that their rights and their Britishness would be undermined. And so the home rule crisis developed and um, resulted in uh, opposition led by Craig and Carson and of course on the uh, 20th of September 1912 a quarter of a million unionists, unionist men and a similar number of unionist women signed the Solemn League, uh, Solemn Covenant and th this is a picture of Carson signing this in, uh, in Belfast City Hall. Um, at that time then both unionists and nationalists begin to arm themselves and we have various accounts of, of gun running and militias being formed. Shortly after the advent of this, the First World War brought the Home Rule um, Bill to an end or the Home Rule Act, whichever it was. It was shelved for a while. The shooting of Archduke Ferdinand and the um, resultant uh, war that enveloped Europe and the central powers um, saw Irish men, because there was no Northern Ireland at that time, saw Irish men go from unionist and from nationalist communities to fight against the central powers. Uh, we have Redmond's uh, forces and so forth. And of course, we have the beginning of the um, the 36th, 30, 36th Ulster Division. And so with, as we can see, these are the events that lead up to the birth of Northern Ireland. In the midst of the war, then of course, nationalism had taken a move towards a more Republican view uh, that home rule under British control or under the empire or under the sovereign parliament of Westminster was no longer acceptable and Sinn Féin shifted from Griffith's early view uh, towards one of total separation from Britain and the, the inception or the setting up of an Irish state, uh, an Irish Republic. And so we had the 1916 Easter Rising. And of course, in the same year, we had the Battle of the Somme and the Battle of the Somme is, is, is a, an event that had a massive influence on what would happen after the First World War. It has a, even to this day, it resonates in the psyche of Ulster Protestants and Unionists. Less so perhaps, even though on the battlefield, there were men of a nationalist persuasion but for many years, and we know this to be the case, the contribution of nationalist soldiers 
in the First World War was underplayed because it didn't and, do, and perhaps today still doesn't sit comfortably in some quarters with an Easter rising and the, the establishment of a republic and separation and taking of control of, of the country's affairs uh, by Irish men and Irish women. And so this, this battle, the Battle of the Somme, when thousands upon thousands of Ulster men were lost, it, it, it was something that this, this sacrifice no doubt played into the inception, the birth, the beginning of Northern Ireland. Indeed, in my own family history, um, th this young man, my great, great uncle, Thomas Chesney Gurley, was killed in action on that very first day, on the 1st of July, 1916, at the Battle of the Somme. And here's a, a little um, or a little short um, comment in one of the local papers. He had just returned from Canada, had returned to Ireland and enlisted, and um, very shortly thereafter, lost his life on the battlefield. And uh, with the centenary and this time, this decade of centenaries, um, the centenary of the Battle of the Somme was, was a time when I decided that I had to go and find uh, out as much as I could about my uncle. And I went and found his, it's, it's not his grave because his body was uh, in, on the field um, in, in battle and wasn't recovered. But this is a, 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 a stone that is raised up in, in memorial to him in, in the cemetery at Lorne. So the, the First World War brought about some really striking and important um, events. It resulted in the demise of four of the great empires, the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the, the Russian Empire, um, and also the German, and had Obviously, then the the British Empire itself was beginning to to see the impact of, of that First World War and that move for change, and and at this time, a lot of new states were formed, basically out of the crumbling of these empires, and so um, we we see that um, states such as the the Weimar Republic, Austria, Hungary. Turkey, Serbia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, um, Ukraine, Bulgaria, Romania was expanded and Greece was expanded. And all of these countries um, came into being. And in that, in that sense, if we, if we view Ireland in terms of its historical context at this point, the establishment of Northern Ireland and the Free State, as it would be called, was in keeping with what was happening in the rest of Europe, was in keeping with this establishment of new nation states based around ethnic um, uh, ethnicity and also based around the, the principle of self-determination. And in, in the coming into being of Northern Ireland, we see this played out. It is really no different. And yet, in many ways, it's a lot, a lot less bloody and gruesome, even though many atrocities happened in either camps and within camps. Yet, Northern Ireland and the Free State becoming nations is in my view, something that was, that synchronized with what was happening in the rest of Europe. And of course, at that time, the League of Nations was established. But with a, a, another factor is the election of, of 1918. And the election of 1918 really, and in this map, you can see that really there are two states within the island. There are two states within the island. In the southern counties that would become the Free State, you can see Sinn Féin completely wiped out other Irish nationalist parties. 
unionist representation was left in and around Dublin and, and connected to Trinity and, and Rathmines. Unionist representation, although unions were 10% of the population of these southern counties, was minimal. In the north, you can see that the, the purple or the blue, whichever color it is there, um, you can see that Irish unionists took a significant majority in the north. Essentially, this election and this map, in a sense, portrays what was about to happen, that there would be a separation, that the rights of self-determination of unionists were as important and crucial. They had the right to their own self-determination, as had nationalists who were over who had voted overwhelmingly for Sinn Fein and its agenda of a republic. And that republic, of course, would eventually separate completely from any British Commonwealth or empire. And so we see in the seeds or in the events leading up to 1921, we can see that this separation almost was becoming inevitable. And so in following the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, Northern Ireland came into being. It would be six counties. It was probably somewhere around two thirds Protestant Unionist and one third Catholic Nationalist. And of course, we understand that James Craig was the first Prime Minister of, of Northern Ireland. In the Free State, the 26 counties, we have a 90% Catholic Nationalist majority and 10% Protestant Unionist. And of course, um, that new state that would come about in the next year or so um, would be led by Eamon de Valera. One of the things that President Woodrow Wilson was concerned about in the formation of all these new nation states, these small states based on ethnicity and the principle of self-determination was how they would treat their minorities. In fact, this view was echoed by none other than Sir Edward Carson, who was the, the lead person of the Ulster Unionist um, opposition to Home Rule. The Dublin barrister who stood with the Ulster Unionists. He said, because he did not see the state, he did not view the state of Northern Ireland as necessarily a victory. It was not what he wanted. But when Northern Ireland came into being, he warned, as Woodrow warned, that how unionists who were in an overwhelming, overwhelming majority would treat the minority would be of massive significance and importance. And he said that basically unionists had to get it right. Now, Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States had these concerns because in self-determination, that's okay for the majority group. But where you have a minority, their interests and their rights can be suppressed. And so we find within the free state that the population of 10% Protestant moved by 30% from 1911 to 1926. It diminished by 30%. There are many reasons for that. But although we may find reason and excuse, there is no doubt that part of that diminishing of population was due to how unionists saw themselves undermined and undervalued within the free state. In Northern Ireland, the nationalist majority and minority was significantly greater. And we know, and 
I think unionists would accept. There were significant mistakes made and Carson's voice, the bulwark of unionism, Carson's voice was not heeded as it should have been. And I think unionists have to come to terms with that. Nationalists must also see their part and the part they played in not embracing, welcoming, or joining with the new state. An example, a simple example. Prior to the beginning of Northern Ireland and prior to partition and, and the formation of two states, we had national schools in Ireland. And in my own village, in the national school, Catholics and Protestants and folk of different faiths attended the same school together under the national school system. When Northern Ireland came into being, Lord Londonderry proposed that a system of schooling devoid of religion or with religion separated out until after school classes and so on, that that would be the best way forward and to bring children together. That was rejected, rejected by nationalists and rejected by unionists. And that I think has been a lasting mistake. Mistakes were made and I, I guess we have to move on and learn from those mistakes that were made. And, but I think this, per, this quote is particularly helpful. This is a quote from Professor John Murphy. Um, and he said that partition was the only way out of an insoluble problem. There essentially wasn't any other solution. Nationalism had moved towards republicanism. Unionism was militarized. Nationalism was militarized. The only outcome, if there had not been partition, in my opinion, was a civil war of between religions between unionism and nationalism and the bloodbath on this island. That, in my opinion, was avoided because the right of self-determination was exercised. But the fact that the solution was not perfect, and, and we have to admit, Northern Ireland is not the Sunshine Coast. It is not some little paradise. We have blemishes and blots and warts and incalculable crimes against our fellow human beings throughout our centuries and in particular in our recent troubles. That the solution was not perfect was in the nature of the problem. This was an almost insurmountable problem and partition was really one, a solution to this insoluble problem. We know, we know those of us who are of my age, born in the 60s, the outworkings of disagreements and disaffection. It led to sectarianism, it led to hatred, it led to segregation, it led to distrust. These are horrible images. These are the images of the times that many of us lived through. A time of hopelessness, a time of darkness. Well, you know, I love this place, despite its flaws, its blemishes, the mistakes we've made, the hurts we've caused to each other. I love this place. I love Northern Ireland. And I guess there are th four reasons that I would look at tonight um, briefly with you. Um, 
as to why or how I've come to see my home in a different light. And the first of those is my grandfather. And the second, my education. The third, very significant in my development in my adult years has been the Erasmus project or the Comenius project through schools. And finally, writing a book. I'm not a historian, I'm an enthusiast. And I've written one book, um, and that's all. Uh, it's a book about Con O'Neill. And it's the, perhaps these four, um, these four areas in which I have maybe developed my view, my world view, uh, certainly about this place. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, as I say, I love this place. I love it. I love our heroes. And we can look, many of them flawed. George Best, I, I grew up running around with a number 11 on my back. And then the anomaly, I became a Man City fan. But I love George Best. Many look up to Oshin McConville, greatest goal scorer in, in GAA. Barry McGuigan, one of our great sporting heroes, who's again found himself in the courts in recent days, but who brought that flag, the dove of peace. Mary Peters, who has done much to work towards inclusive education. And Dennis Taylor on the end, and we can mention them all, Joey Dunlop, Jonathan Ray, Willie John McBride. You can go through the list, Rory McElroy. We love them. I love them. And I'm sure most of you love them too. That you are proud of them. Proud that our wee country, the folk from our wee place, punch above their weight in the world. And this guy on the end on the left, Dennis Taylor. I mean, Dennis Taylor, when he won the um, world title in 1985, I was just married and about to go off on my honeymoon and uh, had just returned from Donegal and was watching Dennis Taylor. And when he lifted his cue and he'd potted the, the last black, I let a roar of joy and jubilation and excitement for the snooker player from Cole Island. And I jumped up in the room and smashed one of the, the chandeliers, the fake chandeliers that we had in our new little terraced house. And I managed on the plane over to Manchester to, to get Dennis Taylor's autograph. and was so proud that one of our own had won the world championship and done so well. And I think, I think in nationalist homes and unionist homes and, and, and folk who maybe don't see themselves in those terms, we all reach out and, and love and feel warmth and affection for these great heroes. Of course, many of our heroes are tainted uh, and, and uh, are, don't come without baggage. And the, the man on the left here, of course, I mean, recent times hasn't been exactly uh, a shining light, but we, we love his music. We love his poetry. Who does not love teenage kicks? The undertones. Who doesn't see, um, I was going to say Gary Barlow, but Gary Lightbody, uh, as this young man who is an ambassador for the, the good of our country and, uh, and the good of our people and who brings such, such a wonderful um, music uh, to, to the modern time. And of course, Seamus Heaney. Now, I know that there's a controversy around Seamus Heaney's image being used in the celebration of, of Northern Ireland's centenary because he wrote something about not raising his glass to, to the Queen. I love Seamus Heaney. I love his poetry. Is there anybody in Northern Ireland who, who's, who, who, who maybe wasn't aware that Seamus Heaney might have a nationalist perspective on the world? and had a problem with that. that that's, that's his entitlement. But the beauty of his words can be shared and enjoyed by everyone as he describes our country, our fields, our rivers, our trees, our traditions, our farming, our agriculture, how we treat each other. 
And the beauty of his words sings to every Ulsterman's soul, every Northern Irish man, Northern Irish woman's soul. And we love our heroes and our legends. And Seamus Heaney isn't just your Seamus Heaney because he came from Balaki. Or Van Morrison isn't just my Van Morrison because his house was about 500 metres from my home as a boy in East Belfast. And the undertones don't belong to Derry Catholics. Teenage Kicks belongs to us all. We need to learn to share our culture, to share, to enjoy, to embrace each other's culture. I love our sense of humor. I love it. It's no holds barred. It can be dark. It can be edgy. It can be rough. It can be cutting. If you're a politician or a celebrity and you get too big for your boots, well, you can be sure there'll be somebody on an Ulster television show or an Ulster stage who'll bring you down to size. We all loved our Jimmy. Probably not politically correct for our day, but when we look back, we can see the Belfast humour. More recent times, we've had Derry Girls and it's gone completely across the globe. And it's our humour. It's us laughing at the most difficult, uh, uh, not laughing at, pardon me, but finding laughter in the most troubled time of our recent history. And who hasn't enjoyed Derry Girls? On the Shankle, on the Falls, Malone Road. And speaking of the Malone Road, of course, we have Nigel. We have such a wonderful, warm, yet edgy sense of humour. We are, I suppose, a people who are humble, who can laugh at ourselves. And I, I find that something that is perhaps unique in this world and something that we should be proud of. There's nobody else in the world gets... Um, Things that gets programs like the Soft Border Patrol or give them a headpiece. It's our humor. It's our way. It, it, it's our way of making light of our circumstances and the difficulties that we face. This man, my grandfather, here he is in his black preceptory um, sash. My grandfather, Hugh Gurley, was a simple man, a docker, not a doctor, a docker. He lived in a two up, two down all his life, never had a car, always rode his bike. Cycled every day, swam every day, um, collected dulse, grew lettuce, and shared it with his neighbours. This wee man, probably five foot four, but like myself, is the greatest influence on my life in many ways. Because as an Orangeman and a member of the Black Preceptory, as a, a bandsman, he played the concert flute. He taught me tolerance. Tolerance is, so, is a word that I think is a little bit loaded because it almost, there's a sense in which it's, Tolerance is just um, uh, acceptance, a grudging acceptance. But no, it's, it's not that. He taught me to understand other people's views and opinions and to accept them. To be empathetic towards the other. He taught me not to hold grudge and to see the best in everyone. He taught me humanity. He was the one who gave me a love for the Antrim Coast Road. His stories 
were the stories that resonate with me now and in my childhood. His example, an orange man. In this country, the orange institution has made mistakes. But it has been denigrated and demonized. My grandfather was an orange man who loved his orange order, but he didn't have one bigoted bone in his body. Not one. He was Father Pat Buckley's greatest fan and Lauren. His friends were from all communities and everyone had a good word for him. And he taught me what it was to be, that he could be a man of the orange and yet he could be a man who reached out to everybody. He taught me tolerance and respect. One of the great things he did was to tell me the story and my sister, the story of Finn McCool. We used to jump into bed when we were little kids and he would tell us the story of Finn McCool. The story would change every time, every, every different holiday, every weekend, whatever it was, we were going to, to stay with him. The story would, would change every time. And I loved that story. And never once did I think that Finn McCool wasn't my Finn McCool. Never once did I think that Finn McCool joined to joined or, or belonged to an Irish identity. I owned Finn McCool. He was my Finn McCool. So much so that you can see from this picture, two weeks ago when we were celebrating Northern Ireland centenary in our school, I told the story to the young children. I've told the story of Finn McCool in Turkey, in Sweden, in, Dem in Germany, in Italy, in France, Poland, across the world. I love the story, this hero, Finn McCool, this great legend. And you know, I, I think... We can all embrace that story. Who doesn't love going up to the causeway and, and, and telling your friends who've come over, maybe from America or Australia or visitors from England or wherever, telling them the story, the legend of Finn McCool and taking them along the, the causeway to find the boot and look at the, the, the giant's organ and, and telling them the stories of the, of the great hexagonal granite rocks. Finn McCool. In my education, strangely enough, I lived in Beaver um, from I was one year old until I was 11. Beaver uh, Estate is a large, uh, largely Protestant working class housing estate, housing development. And I lived there and I went to school there. And in my school, the things that stand out for me, the stories that stand out for me, well, well first of all, was a, a trip my P7 teacher took us to find the source of the lagon. And, and we went to Sleeve Crib and we found the little spring and she took us to Leganany Dolmen. And I looked it up, Leganany Dolmen is a, a 5,000 year old portal tomb. I own Legging any dolmen. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. We learned about John de Corsi. We learned about Carrick Fergus Castle. We learned about the Normans. I don't divorce myself from that part of history. I embrace it. It's part of me. And then we learned the story of St. Patrick. I remember in P6 learning the story of Red Hugh O'Donnell. I never learned about King Billy in my school, not in primary school, not in secondary school. I never heard about Ulster Scots in my primary school. I never knew about Hugh Montgomery and James Hamilton. I didn't know. My cultural identity was largely hidden from me in my education. When I went to Limavati Grammar, when my dad moved 
to work in DuPont. I learned and loved the story of the Hound of Ulster, Cahoolan, from the Ulster Cycle. I loved the story of this great warrior hero, this great hound, the man who killed the chief's hound and had to become his hound. That's my story. I love that story. We share that story. There is a real danger that we segregate off history into chunks that suit our outlook on the world, that suit our identity. For me, history happened. I didn't make it happen. I didn't create it. But in a sense, I'm the result of that history. I have to accept that history. I have to accept that history as coming from its time, its place. Too often, we try to view history through the lens of liberal democracy of today. That was completely foreign in the past. It was a nonsense to view the world of yesterday with the glasses of today. Of course, we learn lessons from viewing and analyzing and looking at history. And we understand a little bit more about how we came to get ourselves to be where we are. The Erasmus program was also something, and I'm, I'm gonna have to rush on. The Erasmus program was is something that um, between schools in Europe that received funding from British Council and it was something that I joined with um, about 14, 15 years ago. And the Erasmus program was something that opened my eyes because when I visited other countries, I suddenly realized that these people, the teachers in the school, the children in the school, the families in the school had a, culture, a cultural identity in their love of their language, in their love of song, in their love of music, in their national dress, in the foods that they celebrated and loved to share with you. I suddenly began to see that I lacked that cultural identity. I lacked that sense of who I am and being able to share and bring to the table something from my cultural background, something from Northern Ireland. I, I guess it was through that that I started to look at my Ulster Scots identity. It was then that I began to think about, you know, what can I share? What can I bring when folk come over and, and visit? What, what is there from my, from Northern Ireland that I can share with them? And it didn't take me too long to find out. Uh, we were working with a, 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 my school from the control sector, largely, I suppose, viewed as being Protestant, um, and another school from the maintained sector, from the, from the largely a Catholic um school system and being paired with uh, that partner school it wasn't enough for me to bring Ulster Scots to the table we had to bring the Irish cultural dimension to the table and it was in that moment and in that time that I began to see that you know something I can learn to embrace this other aspect of culture. I can enjoy this. My daughter had gone to Irish dancing and I loved that. But it was through Erasmus that I started to see that in Northern Ireland, we have a unique opportunity to celebrate two cultures. And when I brought a lambeg drum into a parochial hall in Belfast, and we had Irish dancers and Highland dancers and Irish music and Highland music and Scottish music. I suddenly realized that Northern Ireland has can be the most special place on this earth. That we have so much to give each other. My culture as a unionist, as an Ulster Scot, 
should not be a cold house to those who view themselves as Irish or nationalist and vice versa. We have an opportunity in this place with our diversity to grow individually and collectively. And we have an amazing, amazing music and culture. We have amazing, unique expressions. I just love this. I love our local little phrases and sayings, wind your neck in, quit your faffing about, coming up the lagging in a bubble, scundered. What a great Ulster Scots term, scundered. He fell on his hoop. We've just a way with words. We've a great way with words. And we've great sayings and great expressions. And these don't belong to any one of us. These don't belong to any particular group. There are we expressions. There are we unique sayings. And, and I've found that folk from different countries love these little sayings and they love to find out what they mean. And it's a little bit of, it's a, it's earthy. It's, it's certainly not um, language that you might say is well polished, but it certainly resonates. It's clear and it says what it says. It says exactly what it says in the tin. It means what it says in the tin. And don't, don't we all, don't we all just love sharing our places? Don't we just feel so proud when we take folk on that Antrim Coast Road, when we take them across the Carrickareed Rope Bridge, when we walk out onto the stones at the Giant's Causeway, when we visit the Titanic Belfast Centre, and we tell them that the Titanic was built in Belfast, and we speak of pride and we joke about it was, it was okay when it left here. It was built by Irishmen and sunk by an Englishman, and we joke and we jest about it. And we find humor in this darkest of, of times, of course. And don't we love taking people into our forests and to our rivers and to our waterfalls and to our special places? And don't we have pride in this wee place, this unique place that we call home? St. Patrick, when I learned about him at school, I didn't think twice about him being a Catholic saint or a Protestant saint. He was our St. Patrick. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to uh, plunge a, a Union flag or a, or a trickler on the top of Slemish and claim St. Patrick for one side or the other. He's our saint, our patron saint. We may have different views on what saints are, but essentially he's our Patrick. And when I have taken folk around on the St. Patrick Trail, I haven't thought about him as being someone separate from me, foreign to me. He's my Patrick and he's yours. He's ours. No better breakfast in the world. No better breakfast in the world than the Ulster Fry. Forget the all day breakfast and that nonsense. This is where it's at. Don't you just love sharing what makes us, us? Don't you just love talking about bush mills and maybe going up for a, a taste with your friends who've, who are visiting? And aren't you proud of this great product? Of course we are. Because we have much to celebrate in this place. Yes. We have come from a from a, a, a time of great trial and, and great tribulation. But we've come to a brighter place. Is it perfect? No. Is it fixed? No. Is it fixable? Yes. But only if we come together. The fourth element, and very quickly, is the writing of this book about Con O'Neill. Now, Con O'Neill... Um, 
uh, basically this happened because I walked my dog probably 15, 16 years ago up in the Cassare Hills. And at night I was wondering how on earth did, uh, I wondered about ghosts. Not, I don't believe in ghosts, but just in my, as I walked the dog in the darkness, <laughs> I began to think about were there Celtic warriors, Gaelic warriors who roamed this hillside And I began to think about it. And I began to think about Castle Ray. And I began to think, um, where was the castle? Where is the castle in Castle Ray? How, how did Castle Ray get its name? Who, if there was a castle, who controlled it? Who built it? And what happened to it? And it was that um, those questions that started me on a journey to find out about this man called Con O'Neill, who gives his name to Conswater Shopping Centre and Consbrook Avenue and... Um, uh, the Conswater River and so on. Con O'Neill, he was a man who lived approximately 400 years ago. He owned a vast territory called Upper Clannaboy. The Upper Clannaboy O'Neills had come down from Tyrone in the 13th and the 14th centuries and had established themselves in uh, Antrim and in Down. And after they separated and to Lower and Upper Clannaboy, um, the chiefs of Upper Clannaboy, um, their, their last representative was Con O'Neill. And for 10, 12 years, I researched his life and produced this book, Con O'Neill, The Last Gaelic Lord of Upper Clannaboy. And one of the wonderful moments of researching the book was to find Con O'Neill's signature in the public record office of, of Northern Ireland. But, but Con O'Neill's story is a difficult story because Con O'Neill's story has... Um, really is a, is a turning point in, um, in history. It's a pivotal point in the history of Ulster because essentially following on from um, Hugh O'Neill's rebellion, Tyrone's rebellion and, and subsequent defeat, Gaelic Ulster would never be the same again. Uh, and Con O'Neill found himself in a difficult position where uh, following a, a, a banquet in his house at Christmas, um, he ran out of wine. He sent to cut the chase very quickly. He sent his, his men into Belfast, which was just a village at the time, to find uh, barrels of wine, which he had hidden away from the customs men. And on the return to the castle, they were intercepted by English soldiers. A fight ensued and uh, they lost the wine. The wine was confiscated from them. Con, when his men returned, flew into a drunken rage and told them to go back and, and recover the wine or, or that they were not welcome in his castle. The men did so, and in the, the quarrel that ensued, you could call it the quarrel of the barrels, an English soldier was killed, and several of Con's own men were killed. This, um, Sir Arthur Chichester, um, who was the then governor of Carrick Fergus, viewed as insurrection. And Con O'Neill found himself in Carrick Fergus Castle and basically on a death sentence. His wife, being a, 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 also a, a of royal um, Gaelic descent, a very intelligent woman. She brokered a deal with Hugh Montgomery, a Scot who had trading links with Carrick Fergus. And Con was sprung from Carrick Fergus Castle, taken across to Scotland. And from there, he went to England where King James I had taken the throne and received the pardon from King James I. Part of the deal, for Con to be sprung from Carrick Fergus prison and escape the death sentence was that he would give 50% of his lands to Hugh Montgomery. And in this deal and, and in the outworking of that deal, Con would eventually lose all of his lands. And what would happen would basically be the demise of the Gaelic way of life in Upper Clannaboy and the coming in of the Scots. And we know that from 1606 onward, the Scots came in in their droves uh, under the um, marshalling, if you like, of Hugh Montgomery and, and James Hamilton. And so we, we find this new settlement, this migration of Scots into Ulster and the establishment of new communities, new civilization, new settlements, new buildings, new tongue, new foods, new customs, new dress, a new way of life uh, into, into this part of, of Ireland. And I suppose 
in that there is massive potential for division, massive potential for recrimination. Here we see Gaelic control lost to Scottish um, settlers. And I suppose that in a, in a sense is a nub of, of the Northern Ireland problem going forward, or at least part of it. Um, there's massive potential for resentment, massive potential for anger and revenge and conflict. But in this, in this seeming um, divisive time in our history, I, um, I, I try to view it in a little bit more of a positive light. And that you may say, well, that's easy for you. But um, very quickly, Con O'Neill um, was a descendant of this man, Abe Wee O'Neill. I'm told that's the Irish pronunciation. Abe Wee was, the, was one of the chieftains in Tyrone. Um, uh, his, his name meant yellow hue. And Abe Wee uh, ruled in 1261. And he was opposed to the Norman uh, settlement, the Normans who had created and established their power base in Ulster. And he fought against them. But having offered the high kingship of Ireland to the king of Norway, a man called Hakan V, who refused that, that offer, um, Yellowhue immediately um, basically um, formed, uh, married Eleanor Denangle. And Eleanor, Eleanor, we have this Gaelic chief marrying Eleanor Denangle, and Eleanor Denangle was the granddaughter of Hugh de Lacey, the Anglo-Norman Lord, and the niece or cousin of the second Earl of Ulster. So even in this um, early time, in this early moment in the history of the O'Neills, certainly their history in Antrim and Down, we, we see the mixing of blood. We see that Gaelic blood and, and Anglo-Norman blood were mixed in this marriage. And some of these little quirks in history, we need to recognize that there isn't some um, pure nationalist bloodline, that there isn't some pure Ulster Scott bloodline. We all have members of our family who have married into other faiths. And, and we are a people, a mixed people. And we must come to an accommodation with each other. We must come to a respectful uh, view of each other. And we must embrace each other less as enemies and more as brothers and sisters. In writing the book, I developed a great affection for Irish place names. Now, our, our Irish place names paint a picture and all of, most of the place names around where I live, which could be construed as a unionist um, area, most of the, the names of the townlands and places are Irish in, a, in an anglicized form. Listen to Brini, the Ford of the Ferries, Knockbrecon, Brecon's Hill, Clonton O'Kelly, the, the Kelly's Meadow. And the O'Kelly's were a great um, underfamily of the O'Neill's of Clannaboy. Castle Ray itself is Anne Castle and Reebach, which is the brindled or the gray castle, maybe indicating that it hadn't been painted white, I don't know. But I developed a real affinity with this, the, the Irish place names. As someone who loves Ulster Scots, that, that doesn't chime with me. That, that doesn't um, sit uncomfortably with me. I, I can embrace that. I can accept that. I can find great understanding in that. We, we had, uh, as part of our celebration of Northern Ireland's um, centenary. We had um, we had the Lambeg drum. We had a fifer. We had Highland dancers. We had uh, many elements that reflected Ulster Scots. I also had an Irish speaker who came and spoke to the children in all the classes and taught them to 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 count in Irish to ten. 
Now, today of all days, I suppose, this little segment is controversial, but it doesn't need to be. Um, I, I decided to, to take a, a, and just write down the numbers one to 10 in different languages. And we have languages here from English, Scots, Irish, French, Spanish, and Italian, German, and Swedish, and I think the other is Danish. Uh, the two I want to draw your attention to are the two in the bottom two rows. And you can see here, these two, um, counting in one to 10 in these two languages is almost, almost absolutely the same. These two languages are called languages. They're not dialects, they're called languages. They're almost interchangeable. They're mutually discernible. You speak one, you can speak the other. This has been a sore point for Ulster Scots. Ulster Scots is a form of English, that's given. But it is a unique form of English. It has its own grammar formation, its own way of putting sentences together. It has its own terms, but it shares many terms with English. And that's natural. But over the years, why is it that today we have only words like wouldn't he, couldn't he, didn't he, shouldn't he, and, and so on? And, and folk maybe laugh and say, well, they're just, it's just a, a, a way of expressing it. It's a dialect, it's an accent, it's, it's careless English. It's not. It's the remnants, the remnants of a tongue. The remnants of a tongue that has been discriminated against, persecuted, put down in favor of the more dominant English tongue. And so when you look at the first two rows, you see that you would almost go, well, those two are pretty much the same. One is Scots and one is English, but they're no less the same than the two languages, Swedish and Norwegian at the bottom. My point is, that maybe we need to learn a little bit more respect for Ulster Scots. And I believe that is happening today. When we look at all these languages, if you look down the columns, there are such similarities between our languages. Street names. I chose this picture and I'm gonna finish very, very quickly. I chose this picture um, because I love the colors and because I love the brick wall and the way it's set out. I, I didn't choose it just because it's Irish. I chose it because actually it's a Irish term for a Scottish word. Bon is something that is a Scottish building, a fortified farmhouse building. So it has that certain irony. And today, and I'm going to say this because I had it planned to say, and what has happened today in respect of, I don't even know the whole news because I've been sitting in front of my computer all day. But in terms of, of language, we know that there is a great um, controversy going on and raging in our, in our country today about Irish language. And I fear, and I'm speaking as a unionist and an Ulster Scot, I fear that what is happening with Irish language is in some way to do with division, to do with politics, to do with creating an exclusive identity, to do with building a wall I have no beef with the Irish language. I think it's in a language that can be loved and shared and cherished and should be taught. I would love to know a little bit more about it. It should absolutely be a part of our society. But language can be divisive. 
for this to work, it must be inclusive. It must embrace the other. It must build bridges and not barriers. Language should not be politicized. I think we have to step back a little and, and ask ourselves, what is the purpose of the promotion of a language at any point in our history? Is it to create territory? Is it to mark our territory? I think in Irish, I believe, that in Ulster Scots and in Irish, if we give both mutual respect, as was promised in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, as was agreed in the new decade, new approach, if we can find a way of bringing the other party with us instead of forcing something, then I think we have more opportunity for success, more opportunity for unity, more opportunity to see folk from a different background, perhaps from my background, embracing that language and learning to love it and share it as ours. Because as, as I've shown, I've tried to show very simply in the street names we have, we have Irish on the tips of our tongues every day. So I think um, what I'm trying to say is that again, in Northern Ireland, we have this unique opportunity to celebrate language and to make what we must allow language to bring us together and not to push us apart. You see, we need to share this space. I think, I really believe that unless, now we don't have so much of a minority, um, we have more or less parity between communities. Well, unless we learn to share this space and do what we teach our kids in school, which is to respect difference and to include everyone, then we will not find peace and reconciliation. And for years to come, this place will be troubled. I think, I think we have a unique opportunity in Northern Ireland. If we can grasp the shamrock and the thistle, if we can bring the two together, then we can create a wonderful place. Northern Ireland is so much better today than it was in my youth. My daughter is growing up being able to go to clubs, being able to go to concerts, not search going into town, not afraid of bomb scares, not reading, not hearing of murder and mayhem every night on the news. This is a better place today, but it can be so much better if we learn to accept, embrace, understand, and then to make what perhaps some say as the other's culture part of our own. And just read one little section and I'll close. <laughs> I'm sure you're glad. Um, just from the preface of my book, which you might want to buy, you might not after tonight. And this is what it says. I would contend that in Northern Ireland, we have been granted a unique opportunity to celebrate two wonderful cultures, Ulster Scots and Gaelic Irish. Of course, it would be naive to suggest that the Scots and Gaelic and, and Irish cultures do not have contentious and conflicting elements. However, this should not preclude my enjoyment of my brother's culture, nor his enjoyment or acceptance of mine. Irish culture should not be a cold house for unionists nor should the expression of Ulster Scots culture 
blow an icy breeze across the shoulders of nationalists. Not an easy circle to square, I accept. But nevertheless, we must cradle the thistle and the shamrock in the same palm if we were to build the shared future for which we all yearn. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that. It was a, a, a fascinating uh, talk and fascinating insight into your background and, and your thoughts. Um, so I'm going to ask the important question now is, do you have Bushmills with your Ulster Fry? Because I think... <laughs> <laughs> no, I should have said not on the, not at the same time, but I'm sure you that... Could uh, be on the winner there. Yeah, um, indeed. So I hope you don't mind, Rui, but um, a number of years ago, you spoke in the museum, was uh, during the launch of your book on Con O'Neill, and you spoke without notes, actually. It was really impressive. You were so enth enthusiastic about Irish, about Ulster Scots and our shared history. Uh, and you're up front like, um, about your politics, about being proud of NI, about um, <clears throat> where you come from. Um, uh, but I hope you don't mind me saying, like, sometimes you're apologetic about that. You're concerned about what people think. Um, yet, if you look at something like the, the CRC's principles of remembrance, so the principles that guide museums, academics, ethical institutions, you know, this recognizes that different perceptions of the past exist, and, and that's okay. It's okay to have um, different opinions. I'm just sort of keen to hear you talk a wee bit more about that. Okay, well, um, obviously, uh, in, in light of uh, things today, I felt, uh, you know, it, it, we do have to be careful, and, and I suppose in a way, part of being Northern Irish is, um, well, some of us are very forthright, uh, we know that from from our politicians. Some of them can be very, very forthright and very dogmatic, but general Northern Irish folk do have a um, do have a window on the other person's perspective. Where one of the slides I had was that we need to be a wee bit more ambivalent, and that ambivalence just means that I'm not just so sure about my ground. You know, I can and and part of my problem in politics, in whether that be conservative. Labour type politics is quite often I can see something in the other person's argument. And I think sometimes that's a healthy place to be because dogmatism and, uh, you know, thinking that you've nothing to learn um, will, will leave society where, where it is, will leave society broken, will leave society dis or, you know, un, ununited. And, and and we get nowhere. I think dialogue, discussion, debate is something I've never been afraid of. Um, but I'm also someone who's prepared to listen and, and see that, you know, there is another perspective on how Northern Ireland was born. Clearly, we didn't come through the troubles without there having been another perspective on Northern Ireland. Um, that met with opposition from another group who equally felt strongly about their determination to see through the, the, min, the maintenance of the union. Um, but I think what the Good Friday Agreement with all its faults, and we're seeing some of those faults play out now, and as a unionist, I, I do have massive difficulties with the change in East-West relations. Um, I, I really hope that the politicians, both locally, in Ireland, in GB, and in Europe, will come to see that while the Good Friday Agreement was imperfect, and, and the cost, the cost to me was, you know, um, and the cost to many of us in release of prisoners and so forth, in the shelving of investigations was massive. Mm -hmm. But when I look at my child born in 1994 and think of the world, the Northern Ireland that she is growing up in, where her friends are from both communities, mine growing up as a boy were not. My friends were Protestants. I, I, my first 
engagement with Protestant Catholic was when I went to Lima Valley Grammar School and someone came up to me in the playground and said, are you a P or a C? I hadn't a clue. Yeah. I, w- I wasn't brought up in a political home. My, my dad was someone who didn't believe in borders at all in the world as a Christian. Uh, my politics was really what I learned myself as I went through life. But today, I, I remember being in Stormont and we were sh- being shown around Stormont. This was in the early days of, of Stormont. And um, the guide was, I'm not sure where she was from, Ukraine or some Eastern Europe country and she was waxing lyrical about what had happened you know like storm of today is a mess my goodness this very day it's a mess and we look at storm as folk from northern ireland and we see the faults and we see the the difficulties between our parties and the the difficulties in power sharing uh particularly where you have five parties but if we were just to sit back and reevaluate where we were, we now are making decisions for ourselves. Well, apart from today, perhaps. Um, and, and we as Northern Irish people are able to discuss our problems, what we think about gay marriage or what we think about the transfer procedure, what we think about the, the health service, what we think about language and culture. These decisions were brought into our lap for us to work out together. And what are, you know, our very uh, youthful democracy, I suppose, post troubles did come a long way, has come a long way, but it's, it, of course, there've been bumps along the way, none more so than three years of not having an assembly and so on, but this is a better place. This is a better place. And I just think that with a bit more resolve and a bit more give and take and a bit less rigidity, then we can, it can be better still. I'm just looking at some of the comments here. I think, I think people appreciate um, honesty. I think they appreciate honesty above all. And you know, you're, you're, you're upfront about who you are, wh- what you think. Um, but then you have this sort of um, counter narrative and that you, you're unionist, but you love the Irish language. You're also Scott and you love the Irish language. You know, it's quite an interesting interplay. Um, I do have a question here from Donald, which is quite interesting. Um, I think we should ask. Um, he says, it's wonderful that you're so optimistic and so proud uh, and you're right to be so. Um, however, the violence from 1968 into the 90s and which is still simmering beneath the surface is a scar which drains so much of the hope and the optimism that there should be. Um, do you not agree? Do you agree? Do you not agree? I do agree it's still under the surface. I do agree. And part of the solution is education. I'm, I, I've been a teacher and a school principal for, well, I'm a, as a teacher for 35 years. Um, I believe that we have to give our children hope, that we have to send our children out into this world with values that will carry through into citizenship and lead them to to create a better world uh, as they go out into it. And so part of the solution here is is education. But I I believe as somebody who who works in a controlled school, a state school, if you like, um, the integration and integrated education has has been an attempt at a solution. And it's a laudable attempt. We can't take that away. This is a a uh, um, massively positive um, development in education in, in the last 20 odd years. But has it worked in really dealing with the undercurrent, the, the tensions that are there in our communities? No, I don't think it has. It, it's small scale perhaps, and that's one of the problems, one of the problems is we live in segregated areas. That's a problem. One of the problems is we have a different worldview. That's a problem. We have different politics. That's a problem. We've, perhaps we are embedded in our cultural background and not stepping out to the other. So I feel the solution still lies within that idea of integration. But for me, it would be better if we started to develop and nurture an inclusive ethos in all our schools. 
I, I can honestly say I was never taught in school to hate the other's culture or politics or or religion. I was never taught that. Never, never one day in my school life. But I think we've got to go beyond that and not just have um, that we don't that that's never been taught, but that we actually positively teach um, appreciation of the other, acceptance of the other, tolerance for the other, understanding of the other's perspective. And by if we create an inclusive ethos, if every school were to sign up to an inclusive ethos and children were taught in school those particular values, I do think that would help. I think education has a big role to play. But if we're going to wait for schools to become integrated schools, with a four school system, it's not going to happen. So we've got to find a, a, a better mechanism to get us to where we want to be. Yeah. Just on that topic, um, and you are a principal of Money Ray Primary. Um, <laughs> and it's not about to become an Irish speaking school, <laughs> please. <laughs> Just for anybody who's maybe thinking, oh my goodness, right, okay. So, no, sorry. You saw the headlines last week. I um, did, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so as a principal, of Money Ray, and um, we have an exhibition opening next week, and part of it is we're asking individuals to write a message to the people of Northern Ireland, to your friends, your family, 100 years from now, so 2121. So it's a it's a short box, it's a small um, A5 piece of card, not to put you on the spot, but what message would you like to send to you know 2021 people who live in in, in Northern Ireland? 100 years from now. 100 years from now. Yeah. 100 years from now oh my goodness um no, i've been awful and fair and put you on the spot <laughs> i'd just love to think that um they could look back to our time and think that we actually put aside our differences and and found in our differences something to celebrate and we fixed it and we put it right mm -hmm. and who knows i mean what what the future holds the history is a cauldron I mean, the states that were created in 1918, you know, probably a hundred years before, no one had thought in those terms. We don't know where we'll be, but hopefully as a people, um, I, I, you know, there's a lot of talk about United Ireland and, and, um, and a lot of folk have that aspiration. And, and that was something that the Good Friday Agreement gave folk and legitimized and and that was and i think folk have have come to accept that but for me if we don't unite this place then the, nothing's happening in any terms i i would hope that what we what happens after that then is is open for discussion but i think the first and most important thing is that we unite our people that catholic nationalists Protestant unionists see themselves as a people together, which I suppose um, is a big ask, but I do think it's achievable with people of goodwill. Okay. Um, just one or two um, questions. Now had a comment about um, De Valera and being anti-treaty. Yeah. He was in power until the 1930s. Um, and Angela... Uh, she was interested in knowing more about um, Carson's attitude to the minority um, and the source that you, the, the remark, the, the quote, sorry. Yeah. Carson wanted to know where it was um, from. Uh, truth is, I can't remember where it was from. I've been scrambling about the last few days. Um, trust me, this talk has changed so many times over the last few days. I couldn't settle my heart on it. And, uh, but it was something that I was reading about the, w w in connection with the, um, Woodrow Wilson and his view on minorities. And when Carson stepped aside, he stepped aside because, well, essentially he didn't feel that that was the, you know, that he, he was an Irish unionist. He became the champion, if you like, of Ulster unionism, but Carson was an Irish unionist and I don't think that ever changed for him. He, he didn't see a victory in a sense in, yeah, of course, Northern Ireland wasn't drawn into a home rule state, as it were, but he didn't see that as the outcome that he desired. I think he he would have much preferred the maintenance of the union 
um, and then um, of Ireland remaining within the the union. But when he left, he he did state, and I, I can try and find it, of course, but that it would be important how unionists would show a magnanimous type spirit towards the nationalist ma minority. And um, I mean, all the in all the situations in Europe where I visited a village in in, um, in Turkey where the whole village had been abandoned by Armenian Christians and there had been a massacre of the Armenian Christians by the Turks at the end of the First World War and also mass deportation to, to Greece. And this whole village, there was a Christian school just left not, you know, not knocked down, just whole villages just emptied of people. And I, I think Woodrow Wilson was wise in that societies are, you know, majorities in society need to be benevolent and almost, um, in a sense, overplay the interests of minorities. I think to be um, civilized, and, and modern and fair and equitable societies. Um, unfortunately, that this isn't just the, you know, I, I don't subscribe to the view that everything was the fault of nasty unionism. Um, there were faults, there were big mistakes, but, you know, um, these, these mistakes were made in many of these new nation states where um, we see it in the Slovak sort of, um, you know, belt of, of and all the problems around Yugoslavia that have that have reignited in, in recent years and so on. So look, we have come a long way. We, we've come through 30 odd years of absolute devastation to a new place, but it's a beginning. I think it's a beginning now, whether it's the beginning that everybody wants uh, or hopes for it. No, it's not. But but we've got to make this place work first. OK, so Roy, thanks very much. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but um, thanks very much for agreeing to speak to us tonight. Um, thanks for sharing your thoughts and views with us. It was uh, really fascinating. And um, we have to thank the Heritage Fund Shared History Fund who have um, supported the talk. And if I could, I could draw your attention to um, our website, lisbonmuseum.com, and the details are of our next speaker, who's Professor Stephen Royal, and he'll be speaking about industry in Ulster over the last 100 years. Um, his talk's entitled From the Clanging of Metal to the Clinking of Coin, Industry in Ulster, and Steve's a fantastic speaker. So it's going to be a great um, talk to, to end our, um, our run for this side of the summer. Um, I'll also be sending out an evaluation email, so it'd be great if we could hear um, <laughs> reviews if you could share them with us. So once again, thanks very much, Roy, and um, thank you everybody for joining us and, and good night.